I've been thinking about time Where does it go? How can I stop my life from passing me by? I don't know I've been thinking about family How it's going so fast Well, I wake up one morning Wishing that I could go back I've been thinking about lately Maybe I can make a change and let you change me. So with all of my heart, this is my prayer. Singing, oh, Lord, keep me in the moment. Help me live with my eyes wide open. Cause I don't want to miss what you have for me. Singing, oh, Lord, show me what matters. Take away what I'm chasing after. Cause I don't want to miss what you have for me Keep me in the moment Keep me in the moment Keep me in the moment I don't want to miss what you have for me When I wake up in the morning Lord, search my heart Don't let me stray I just want to stay where you are all I got is one shot, one try, one go around in this beautiful life. Nothing is wasted when everything's placed in your hands. Sing and hope, Lord, keep me in the moment. Let me live with my eyes wide open. Cause I don't want to miss what you have for me. Sing and hope, Lord, show me what matters. Throw away. Chasing after, cause I don't want to miss what you have for me. Keep me in the moment, keep me in the moment, keep me in the moment. I don't want to miss what you have for me. Think about heaven and the promise you hold. So it's all eyes on you till the day you call me home. Singing, oh, Lord, keep me in the moment. Help me live with my eyes wide open. I don't want to miss what you have for me. Singing, oh, Lord, show me what matters. Throw away what I'm chasing after. Because I don't want to miss what you have for me. Oh, keep me in the moment. Keep me in the moment. The moment I don't want to miss what you have for me. Oh, keep me in the moment, keep me in the moment, keep me in the moment. I don't want to miss what you have for me. Church, ain't this what we want? I mean, wouldn't it be good if we could just go through the rest of the week and just remember this moment right here? You know, nothing in the world out there could just reach out and bite us. But we could just remember being together, worshiping with the Lord. So sing this. Keep me in the moment. Keep me in the moment. Keep me in the moment. I don't want to miss what you have for me. Good morning, Allen Baptist. Yes, this is our high school. Well, actually, let me first say that I am teaching the high school Bible study class, and this is our class, and not everybody's present today. Um, We're here to share um, the outreach activity that we did this morning. Um, earlier, a few weeks back, the students were handed a binder of index cards, and they were asked to write down their favorite verses, um, you know, verses that they just like. And 
this morning with our our van driver, Dewey, he took us out to several places. Well, he took us out into the community. And uh, these guys are in training to spread the gospel. Um, Church, we have a lost and dying world, you know, out those doors. And if we, as Christians, you know, don't tell them about Jesus, who is? When we go out in the world, we can be protected with the armor of God. In Ephesians 6, verse 13, it says, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, verse 14 tells us to stand firm. You know, we can be very strong with the Lord. And um, we got to act like it and be powerful out there. Um, okay, so what they got to do is they took their verses and they placed these on cars, you know, and on several cars. And in hopes that, you know, the person in the car or person's We'll take that verse, you know, read the verse, and, you know, get something of it. I mean, maybe it'll trigger them to go to their Bible. Um, but we know that it's God's will for us to share his word, the gospel, and that's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, also, you'll notice that we're wearing shirts that say, I am second. This is our class theme, and it's a reminder that God, God and others are first. When we become a Christian, we live for him. And he completes us. He satisfies us like nothing in this world can. And, when, and then, you know, we have a new purpose in life. And there's not a better life. Um, I just want to end with saying that I'm super proud of our high school Bible study class. And I want you all to keep us in your prayers um, because we're going to continue to to go out. And we're just taking step by step. Um, And I'm going to give these students an opportunity to say something that may be on their heart or mind. And that includes Dewey, if he would like to, also. And I appreciate him being with us this morning. Uh, first off, I just want to thank God for giving us the opportunity to do this, and thank you all for coming today, and we just ask that you pray and watch over us as we continue to do God's will. That was quick. <laughs> Folks, I'll... All I really want to say is is to challenge you all, if you have any youth that lives within, I don't know, 100 miles of you, invite them. It, it just takes that one step to, to, to do that, you know, and, and they may never have been invited to church before. So just, just that one simple act open their eyes and that's a challenge for for me as well and and all up here is that the lord puts puts an opportunity in front of us every day to to share him with someone be it either in 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 word or be it in action and that's what we're here to do we're here to glorify him we're here to share what he's done to us and if it's nothing more than what he's done for me or for you. That's all you have to do. We're watching The Chosen here on Wednesday nights. And, and the one thing, the one part that really got me the other night was, was Mary was saying, you know, I was this way, now I'm this way, and the only difference in between was him. How simple is that? So, if you, if you know of any youth, get on to them, 
teachers, I know you have no problem nagging kids. Nag them. Just do what we can to get them here. Thank you all. Yeah, and church, we invite you also to, to join us, you know, into going out in the world um, and spreading the gospel. You know, look for opportunities. Um, that's, that's just be, being obedient. Thank you for your time, and keep us in your prayers. I talk with the Lord Many nights by my bedside I ask His forgiveness as I knelt to pray And if I could repay I'd be only too willing for he died on the cross just to save me from sin. There's a light guiding me. I can see heaven's glory. And he holds me steadfast in his ways and his love. He's guiding me. To my guiding me to that heaven above and to the far distant shore many friends have gone from me they're singing the victory of God's love I know Through the valley of death, I'll be led by my Jesus. He will carry me through, though I'm weak and I'm bold. And there's a light guiding me. I can see heaven's glory. in his way and his love he's guiding me through temptation and evil there's a light guiding me to that heaven above and when that great heaven's glory my hope that my soul will be free from all cares he'll open the gate and bid me to enter when the roll's called up yonder I pray you'll be
What will it be like when my pain is gone and all the worries of this world just fade away? What will it be like when you call my name and that moment when? I see you face to face I've waited my whole life to hear you say Well 
it, Doug. Keep that chorus up. I mean, church, what are we fighting for? What are we fighting for? Man, I'm a fighting every day just to get to him just to see my Jesus for him to say well done enter in we're fighting church we're in a battle we're in a battle with ourselves we're in a battle with the enemy we're in a battle with the world be in no battle Jesus then went to the cross God's fighting the battle the battle's already won we're just dumb we're sheep we can't realize that it's won don't you feel the battle's won this morning does anybody feel the battle's won this morning so do you want to hear well done, well done, my good and faithful ones. Welcome to the place where you belong. You know, we all want to belong somewhere. Well done, well done, my beloved child. You have run the race and now you Welcome to the place where you belong. Well done. Any kids out there? I got something to show you again. Come on. We got to have some. Ryan, don't hide on me. <laughs> Here they come. Come on down. I got something to show you. As usual. As usual, I have something to show you. I got two somethings to show you this time. Two things. <laughs> you believe that? Why not? Why don't you believe me? Do you believe me? Yeah, you believe me. Okay. Hi, right, come on down. I got something to show you. <laughs> Look at this. What do you think that is? Feel it. What is that? Wood. wood, that's right. It's a piece of wood. You see that piece of wood? See that piece of wood? Guess where that piece of wood's from? First of all, what kind of wood is that? You know your wood. What kind of wood is that? You think maybe it's pine, oak, oak. You think oak? We don't have any of this wood in the United States. Well, maybe, maybe some places. I don't know. Not a lot of it. it they, there's something that comes from this that they make oil out of. I'm giving you all kinds of hints. What do they make oil out of that comes from a tree? It's not fish oil, right? Fit, fit, well, maple syrup, that'd be good. That's not maple, though. I wish it was. But <laughs> actually, olive oil. You heard of olive oil? So this is olive wood from an olive tree. Now, guess where I got this? Okay, the, the places in the world that are big for olive trees and olives are Greece and Israel. You think maybe Israel? You think maybe the place that Jesus was born? Have you heard of that place? What's that place called where Jesus was born? 
Bethlehem. That's right. This wood came from Bethlehem. Now look at that again. It's pretty rough, isn't it? It's pretty rough. Rough stuff. Look at that. Yeah. See there, it's rough. But you know, you can take stuff that is rough and make something pretty out of it. You believe that? People know what they're doing. For example, look at this. This is made out of olive wood from Bethlehem. Look at that. It's got my name on it. See that? Look at there. Those two things. That's rough, right? You can't hardly tell that anything good can be made out of that. Maybe a doorstop, you know, it's kind of shaped that way. But somebody else looks at it and says, that could be beautiful, and I could turn it into a pen. And they did. So here's life just in the rough, just in the flesh, some might say. Just uh, the way, just normal, just every day, right? Just a piece of wood. This is that same life where the master looks at it and says, I can do something with it that's real beautiful. So today, let's, let's, let's make this look like life in sin, life in the flesh, life the way we would live it. This is the life in the spirit, the way God sees it. Which one is more beautiful? Pen. The pen, right? Pen. Because when the master takes your life and shapes it, he always turns it into something beautiful. Thanks for listening to me. God bless you.
Today, doing what you please. That doesn't sound right for a sermon, does it? <laughs> but uh, in the middle of this, uh, uh, well, toward the end, not in the middle of this series of sermons called The Brand Marks of Jesus. Uh, and that, of course, is from Paul in chapter 6 uh, that we're coming up to. And verse 17, he says, From now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. And uh, we're looking at trying to pick up from the book of Galatians instructions how we might be brand marked uh, for Jesus, meaning that he owns us. Uh, how that we might get to the point where we've been through enough and have enough marks in our walk with the Lord of the troubles we've been through that nothing is going to bother us anymore. No one, no thing. Because I stand for the Lord and I'm brand marked as His. And that's what we're trying to uh, learn from Galatians today. Uh, Galatians chapter 5 verses uh, 13 through uh, 17 and I'm entitling this, uh, uh, the, uh, Doing What You Please. And I think you'll see what I mean uh, as we read the passage. So if you can and will, stand with me as we read God's Word today. Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets itself its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Uh, may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word today. You may be seated. Doing what you please. I, I, I think uh, Paul has established, and we have in this series of sermons, that it was for freedom that Christ set us free, right? Free from the law. Uh, we could also say free from the bondage of sin in our life. Uh, so freedom uh, from sin, we're no longer under that bondage of, to those type of things, the addictions to, uh, to the things of this world. Uh, and we're set free. Set free for what though? We're set free to serve God as was intended for us and what we were made to be like. Uh, here he points out that we were not set free to serve the flesh again. You know, flesh is a word you find in the New Testament used meaning that uh, this fallen world in which we live, uh, this fallen flesh in, wh in which we re reside now, uh, uh, as opposed to the things of God. And that's what he means when he says flesh. So he didn't set us free so that we could serve our flesh again. The question is whether we should just do as we please after being set free. Now, I'll remind you, if you were here last week, of the story I told about my mother and her cousin. And uh, she said, well, once you're saved, then you can do whatever you want. And her cousin said to her, yeah, but your wanter has changed. You remember that story? Here's the thing, doing as you please. In one sense, we're free to do as we please because now we are free to serve God. We've been set free from sin. We've been set free from the law so that we might willingly as a child in the family of God do what we want to do. Amen? And I think that's a dynamic that is so lost in Christian life today. It's as though, oh, I'm saved. Now I can't do what I want. Well, I think maybe you might look back and see if you were saved or not because you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away and all things become new. I want to be truthful with you today and just say from the beginning of this sermon, even though it's not the thrust of the sermon today, but it's the truth of the gospel. If you find in your life a struggle 
Now, I'm not talking about a struggle of the pull of sin in your life. All of us fight with that as we go through the sanctification process in our life. And you'll point out, people will point out, well, the Apostle Paul had trouble with this too when he said, that which I want to do, I don't do, and that which I don't want to do is what I do. I think there's a misunderstanding there. Paul said what he wants to do is serve God. Right? Don't miss that point. He falls sometimes, and he has to repent and ask God's forgiveness. But I'm talking to you today who what you want to do is sin. If it wasn't for that doggone church and preacher and Bible, I could do what I want to do and go out there and carouse and run around and do everything that that I want to do. If you're that person today and that's your struggle that you're something wrong with your wanter, then you need to come down front, even right now if you want, and get saved. Because you're lost as a goose and you're going to hell. Okay? Because a child of God wants to serve the Father. Wants to serve his fellow man and his fellow Christians. Wants to do what is right. And only slips up when the devil tricks them. Understand that dynamic today. If that's you, nobody's going to look at you badly. If you get saved today, they'll all celebrate. Okay? But he points out here, he says, you're not just free to do what you please. And here he's using it in the context of falling back and living a fleshly life. You're not free to do that if you're a child of God. As a matter of fact, that's not what you ought to want to do. (laughs) The question is whether we should just do fleshly things after being set free. Obviously, we should want to please our Father who saved us when we were hopeless. But the flesh honestly still tugs at us, doesn't it? Still gives us problems. So the question for the day is, how can we stand firm in freedom to serve God as a child of God? How can we overcome this tug of the flesh that might want to pull us back to being under bondage again? How can we stand firm? Well, I think there's a couple of things in this passage we read today that gives us advice and guidance in this matter. First of all, if you want to escape that tug of the flesh and not be once again under that bondage, you do so first by loving and serving each other. Look at verses 13 through 15 again. For you were called to freedom, brethren, Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you're not consumed by one another. We're set free. And to remain in that freedom and to stand in that freedom, one of the components that helps you to do that is learning to love each other. Love. Not loving is fleshly. It's on the opposite side of the spirit. You know that love is a verb in the biblical uh, uh, use of it. It is a verb of action. This is why he says, through love, serve one another. Uh, You know, so loving your brethren, each other in the church, brothers and sisters in Christ, part of the family, loving each other is serving each other. Because love is not just a word you use, it's an action you do. Does that make sense? Serve each other. Serve each other. How do you serve the parts of the body of Christ that we are by serving in the church. If in your life you're not seeking to find a place of service so that you might demonstrate your love by action, there's something wrong with your walk and it's fleshly, not spiritual. Are you hearing me? 
This applies to all of us, me included. Of course, he's talking about the command found in Leviticus 19.18, and he's quoting it. As a matter of fact, he says, this is the fulfillment of the whole law. Did you notice he said that? This is the fulfillment of the whole law, that you love your neighbor as yourself. In Mark 12, Jesus identifies this as the second great commandment, right? In James 2, James refers to it as the completion of the royal law of God, to love your neighbor as yourself. When do we know that we're not standing in the freedom that Christ gives us? When we are not loving each other. It's not just me that said that. You recall that Jesus said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Obviously, the reverse of that would be true. Nobody will know that you're a real true follower of Jesus Christ if you don't love your brothers and sisters in Christ. <laughs> That's why many times these church splits, these church divisions, do irreparable harm to the preaching of the gospel. When are we to love each other? Only when people are lovely? No. Always. Only when we agree with each other? No. Always. Love one another. So when do we know that we're not standing? When we are biting and devouring one another, he says. He says this only results in everybody being consumed. He's using figurative language, of course. Nobody's actually eating somebody. This is not talking about cannibalism. <laughs> no, he's using figurative language to say if you were to do that and everybody was biting and devouring each other, it'd be pretty soon there wouldn't be anybody left. And shall I say, churches, and I've seen it over and over again in my long 60-some years of service, I've seen churches that can't get past biting and devouring one another, and today they're dead. We must love each other. This is how we stand in our freedom. And then the second way that he tells us that we can stand in our freedom to serve God, to have our want or right, to want to serve God, to not fall back to the desires of the flesh. The second way is by walking by the Spirit. You know, in some places you can see and read walking in the Spirit, and that's okay. But I like what he uses here, walking by the Spirit. Listen to it again, verse 16 and 17. But I say... Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Meaning here in his phrasing, the things of the flesh. When he says, walk by the Spirit... <laughs> You know, that little word by is important there. Uh, it, it sort of infers that you can't walk right with God without the Spirit. You know, uh, 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 ride by a car. Without the car, you're not riding. Walk by your legs. Without your legs, you're not walking. Walk by the Spirit. Let him be that which empowers you to walk. Now here, when he says walk, uh, it, it, it's, it's, sick, it's uh, a symbolic of your life. It means your walk, the way you do things, the way you go through life. The way you go through life should be by the Spirit. By the Spirit. It's referring to living every day by the Spirit. He says... This is in direct opposition, he says, to living by the flesh, right? So how do you carry out your life? Is it by the paycheck you get? Huh? Is it by 
uh, uh, the job that you have? Is it by the degree that you hold? Those are all fleshly things. We're to walk if, as though the only way we can do our life on a daily basis is with the Spirit, and without Him, we won't be able to walk. The Holy Spirit seeks to guide us on a daily basis. How well do we allow this to happen would be the question. Think about it yourself. When you get up in the morning, are you planning the day by the flesh or by the Spirit? That's a real question, folks. It's not a foolish question. There is no in-between. The simple truth is this. If you do not consult the Holy Spirit in your daily life, you'll be living by the flesh. It's either one or the other. You might think there's an in-between, but there is not. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. He either will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth, and here wealth, or mammon, as the King James put it, is the same idea of the flesh. The same idea, the things of this world, the things in this world. You cannot serve one or the other. There is no in-between. Oh, I think today when I get up in the morning, I may have forgotten to consult God, but I will be all right. I'll still do it right. No, you won't. There is no in-between. You're either serving one or the other. Who are you serving? Yourself, that's flesh. Your family, that's flesh. Your job, that's flesh. There's only one thing that's a spirit, and that's a spirit, and that's with a capital S, and there's only one God, so you could replace it and say you're either serving God or the flesh, one or the other. So walking by the Spirit is not just a feeling. It is based upon the truth of God's Word. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17, you know it, the armor of God, right? The armor of God, he identifies the Word of God, the Bible, as the sword of the Spirit. Correct? The sword of the Spirit. So walking by the Spirit is not just a feeling you have. I feel like I'm doing the right thing. I feel like I'm walking in the Spirit. No, if you're saying, I feel like, you're making you the boss of that, and you are the flesh also. There's only one thing that's a spirit, and that's God. And there's only one place you can go to identify what the spirit has to say, not what you made up, and it is right here, the sword of the spirit. And so, it is not enough to say, I feel like I'm doing the right thing. You need to know that you're doing the right thing. And these things are written to you that you might know. John would say that you might know that you're saved. But I'd also say these things are written unto you that you might know God's will. You might know His commands. As a matter of fact, we do everything we do here at Allen Baptist Church built off of the commands of Christ. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself that Paul was talking about in this passage. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Right? This is what we do because the sword of the Spirit says that's what a church does. But the sword of the Spirit also instructs you and me as to how we live. As to how we live. So walking by the Spirit, once again, is not a feeling that you have. It's based upon the truth of God's Word. Let me ask you this question. 
When was the last time you consulted the Bible when you make your daily decisions? Huh? You say every decision? Yes. The Scripture, the sword of the Spirit, says whatever you do in word or in deed, do all to the glory of God. There's only one thing that glorifies God, and that's obedience. Right? It's better than sacrifice, the Old Testament prophets would say. What good is sacrifices or coming to worship or going to Bible study or anything like that if you do not obey? It means nothing. It means nothing. God's not up there with a holy checkoff list checking down every time you went to church. No, or every time you read your Bible. No, he's saying to you, when was the last time you did what I told you to do? That's what he wants. And by the way, he sees directly to the heart, not just outward appearance. When was the last time you consulted the Bible? Okay, consulted the Bible. About whether I get up or not? About what I wear? About what I do? Even about what I eat? Yes, there's instruction in the Bible about all of that. Not thou shalt and thou shalt not, but principles. Principles. Even to the point of whether you eat meat or not. I said, what? Yeah. Isn't that what Paul said? He said, if eating meat shall do harm to my brethren, I'll eat no meat. Right? You, there's things in the Bible. You see, the reason that so many of us don't know is because we don't read. The reason so many of us don't know is because we don't go to Bible studies. The reason so many don't know is they don't come to worship and hear sermons about the Word of God. So they do not rely upon the Holy Spirit and we make our decisions built upon what we think and that's in the flesh. If we're going to stand in the freedom as a child of God to serve as we should, we need to walk by the Spirit, and that includes doing things by the Word, by the book, I should say. So then, we are free to willingly do God's will as identified in His Word. You see, the bondage of sin will keep you from doing that. The bondage of the law will keep you from doing that. We've been set free from those things so that we might willingly, because that's what we want, do God's will. And that's standing in freedom. So today as Jody and the guys come and we prepare to close this sermon and close this service today, I want to take us once again to Jesus. I mean, that's pretty good to take us to what he had to say, right? John 8, 34 through 36. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly. When you see that double, verily, verily, in the King James, it was a way in the original language to say, to underline this. I, I, I want to say it, and now I want to underline it. Okay, does that make sense? I want to say it, and I want to highlight it. I want to say it, and I want to put it in bold. And that's what he's saying. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits, and that word commits is vitally important there because it's in the Greek tense that we don't have in English. It means keep on keeping on, right? Everyone who keeps on keeping doing sin is the slave of sin. Once again, walking by the Spirit. But here Jesus is referring to that person who doesn't walk by the Spirit but walks by sin disobedience and they keep on doing it they might say I know this is wrong you know 1 John 1 9 says if we confess him our sins right then he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to keep on cleansing us from all unrighteousness right but that's a conditional statement have you noticed that if if we confess what is confession confession is agreeing with God Yes, sir, if you want to put it that way. Agreeing with God, this is wrong, and I'm never doing it again. 
So if you keep on keeping on sinning, then the promise to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness is not there either. It's conditional. If we confess, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who keeps on sinning is a slave of sin. You've fallen back to that flesh again. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. And here's what you need to hear today. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Are you free indeed today? The song we're going to sing says, All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all. It's all or nothing, folks. What's your decision today? Let's stand. Feel the Holy Spirit. 